Hey there, I'm Tiffany Youngren, host of Next Step Nation, where we help podcasters and YouTubers with vision become preeminent thought leaders in their industries. You are about to have the incredible opportunity to listen as we dig into the why, who, and what of a podcaster show. Then at the end, we will identify one powerful how, one action that he can take for results in the next 30 days. Today, I am very excited to welcome Professor Pete Alexander, host of Winning at Business and at Life. Hey, Professor Pete. Hey, Tiffany. Thank you for having me on the show, and I really appreciate your listeners' time as well. Oh, you are so welcome. Thanks for being here. Well, Professor Pete has released 309 episodes from February of 2020 until the day of this recording, which is September 21st, 2021. Professor Pete Alexander inspires hard driving leaders and other working professionals with over a hundred innovative and effective stress relief strategies that help overcome their self-imposed obstacles and barriers to success. Pete also hosts his popular seven minute podcast and has been a frequent guest on other podcasts and radio shows. So Pete, why did you start winning at business and life? Well, what I was looking for, Tiffany, at the beginning, around the end of 2019 was um, I, I was on LinkedIn and I had a, a, a good uh, set of contacts, but I wasn't really cultivating that. And I thought, well, what can I do to provide additional value? And so I thought about it and I thought, well, what the heck, I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll start a podcast, see how that goes. And not only did I get to make connections with some wonderful people and extend my connections with some of my, uh, my, my peers, but I also found a love for the broadcast booth again, because uh, that was my original uh, major when I went to, to, to college back in the stone age. Oh. So it was, uh, it, I kind of gave myself uh, almost like uh, paying homage to my uh, inner child by going back and, uh, and doing the podcast so many years later. Oh, I love it. So you, so you took classes in college. Had you done anything else with broadcast since then? No, not at all. Uh, you know, I, I did the classes for a couple of years and the reason I switched from broadcasting and went over to business was because, um, at that time it would have required me to move every three months to a bigger and bigger market. And I had done a lot of moving as a kid and I mm -hmm. was so burned out about it that uh, I thought, nah, I'll, I'll uh, do something where I can stay in a particular location longer. I don't blame you. So now you could have done really a show about anything, considering that you wanted to start your show to, it sounds like to build relationships and then also to, you know, then you fell in love with it again. Why this topic? Well, there were a couple things. Um, one was I wanted to focus on B2B because that's, that's really where my experience is. My career has been almost exclusively in the B2B area. And secondarily, because I was finding that being able to communicate on LinkedIn primary, as the primary uh, platform, that I was able to have co real positive conversations with people. Um, a little less uh, than uh, what we might see on Facebook with some some pretty questionable content, and so uh, so I I thought okay well what can I do you know uh, uh, LinkedIn is primarily a business platform, and so I thought okay so let's what what can I do from a value standpoint and people everyone who's in business has some experience that they can share that others can learn from, and I thought okay let's do that and the um, the format being that it's uh, roughly seven minutes, I wanted to respect the listener's time to be able to get them in and out, get a, get a nugget of information that they could use and that they could run with. I love it. And that's one thing, you know, we mentioned it in the, in the bio early on when we intro introduced you that these are seven minute episodes, which Ah, uh, hats off to you. I'm so impressed. <laughs> so. Well, it's so the range, the range is actually, so the shortest one was a little less than four minutes. Oh, the wow. Guy, the guy was just, you know, well, it few, answers. few words. And, and I mean, even though I tried to get more out of them and then my longest one was 22 minutes. And, <gasps> oh, uh, wow. so, and so I had one that was 22 minutes. I had another one that went 16 minutes and both of those episodes, I, uh, I said, um, 
uh, you know, uh, six questions, seven minutes plus bonus episodes. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. That is so good. Well, I still think that that's, that's so interesting and everybody talks about it, you know, how, I mean, it's true business people are really, really busy. So, um, I think that's really good. And then kind of really digging, you know, right now I'm really digging into the why of your show. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I like that your show, you have a clear, you know, target audience, which is the who, which we'll get into in a minute, but, Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, anywhere I go on your site, like I went and looked at your website and it's clear that you, have some knowledge of, and some care about helping people reduce stress. Is that, does that have anything, does that play into your show at all or? Yeah. So actually, so, uh, when I, when I actually started doing my stress relief work, um, one of the things that I found was that those of us who are in business, who are stressed and, you know, time is a huge component of that. Hmm. And uh, so the book that I wrote, uh, it has over a hundred quick and easy stress relief tips that you can do in just a few minutes. So it doesn't take a lot of time to try it. And then I thought, aha, wouldn't it make sense to have the podcast have something like that as well? Because once again, people are strapped for time. And if they can get something of value in a short amount of time, then they, 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 they're more likely to subscribe. And so that's, that's where the uh, stress relief stuff uh, actually um, gave me some of the format that I decided on, on the show, but it also gave me the opportunity in several of my interviews where, when, depending on what um, my guests are sharing, uh, we'll talk about, okay, is that, how does that either reduce reduce your stress because of the, the, the insight that they're sharing or their, the ideas that they're giving. Um, so that gave me some fodder that I could, could, uh, uh, to further enhance the conversation I was having with my guests. And it seems like, I mean, my, uh, my assumption is that that could have even been inspiration for some of your questions. Cause I know you ask one of your questions is like, what makes you laugh? at work. And we all know that's a good stress relief. So you got it. So, so have, you, have you kept it kind of subtle then? So you're not like bumping people over the head with like, I want you to relieve your stress. You're more like going to do it, not really talk about it so much. Or am I missing, did I miss where you talked about it more? <laughs> no, no, no. So, so you're right about the The second question being what makes you either laugh and or smile about working in your industry. Um, the usually the the stress relief question will come either in the third or the fourth question when I'm asking them, you know, what chapter of the book uh, mm-hmm. of, of a fictitious book they they would recommend or uh, what insight do you want to share, and depending on what they say, what they're sharing, you know, I will I you know I I will inc- be more inquisitive and I'll I'll say something like, uh, you know, if they say that. Um, uh, you got to have trust. And so, so if you have trust, does that, you know, obviously that reduces the stress, you know, there's this level of trust, et cetera. So it, it opens the conversation for a little bit more because, uh, you know, I'm always curious if somebody has an idea that uh, about stress relief that, that, uh, that I can help promote for them. So. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. So now I, this season, I'm like challenging myself to ask the obvious questions. And I feel like in the hot seat, I've, you know, already asked for permission to put you in the hot seat, although I I love my, my guests to be comfortable. So I don't, (laughs) by any stretch want this to be uncomfortable, but I have to, there are three questions that I just feel like I have to ask. Number one, are you a professor? Yes, I am. I'm a for real professor. Uh, I have my PhD in marketing and uh, I taught, I taught, uh, uh, classes for a uh, uh, little over 10 years, uh, closer to 11. And uh, I'm actually uh, going back and teaching a class uh, for Antioch College that I'm currently uh, writing. So, uh, so yes, yes, I am. Love it. Okay. And then, so what is your background in stress relief? So that actually started, um, well, if you say background, it's, it's a lifelong <laughs> background. I mean, what, don't we all have a background in stress relief? I feel like exactly. we all have PhDs, right? Is there some tests we could take? Exactly. But, but, but I mean, like you wrote the book on it. So I, I'm kind of getting, 
uh, I want to get a sense of your authority in this mm-hmm. space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically, you know, obviously we all have that stress and I had it from the dysfunctional childhood on forward to my uh, adulthood. But um, the stress that I noticed actually started back in 2008 when a uh, perfect storm of stressful activities uh, culminated in my diagnosis with stress-induced diabetes. Mm. Now, what happened is, is that in 2008, I didn't listen to my body about what stress was doing to it. And instead, like many people do, I continued to burn the candle at both ends for another 10 years. And I ended up in the emergency room one hour from being comatose with a severe case of diabetic ketoacidosis. And for your listeners who may not know what that is, basically my body was eating itself alive because of my stress. And here is the crazy thing. So you would think I would have learned at that point. No, Uh, (laughs) I was transferred to, after the ER, I was transferred to ICU for the very first time uh, ever in my life. And On my second day in ICU, I was working for a medical device company at the time. I get a text from my boss, my micromanager boss. And the text says, you have a webinar you need to run at eight o'clock. This was at 6 a.m. roughly. What are you going to do about it? Now, mind you, my boss knew that I was in the hospital. (laughs) So, Oh, my gosh. And so what did I do instead of saying, you know, forget you? What I did was I picked up my phone because what a surprise, I didn't have my laptop with me. And I started trying to reschedule this webinar using my phone, pushing the boundaries of the capabilities. And the nurse on staff at the time came over to check my blood. They would do it every, every about an hour. And when I was first admitted, my sugars were so high that the medical grade glucometers could not read it just said high. So they estimated it was eight to 10 times higher than normal. She checks my blood and the prior check and the ones that uh, previously all finally came back into more reasonable numbers. They were still high, but they were more reasonable. All of a sudden, after I started trying to reschedule the webinar, boom, like a 90 degree angle, my num- my uh, glucose numbers started skyrocketing again. And she says to me, this is a complete stranger. She says to me, you realize that's what put you in this hospital bed in the first place. Mm. And it was like, oh, and that was the epiphany moment I needed to hear. I knew other people had told me I was stressing myself out, but this was the first person who I, for whatever reason, I listened to. Mm. And So I basically spent the rest of that day and the next day really contemplating that. And I realized that for so many years, I had been trading my health for my career. Mm -hmm. And that's a really bad trade. So after I got out of the hospital, the day after that, I decided to resign and I focused on just getting my health back. And So I started experimenting with different stress relief tools and techniques. And what I noticed was that not only did my stress go down, my glucose numbers as a diabetic went down, my weight went down, and my energy level went way, way up. It was like I had discovered a fountain of youth. And Mm. here's the crazy thing, Tiffany. If you saw a picture of me 13 years ago in 2008, when I first was diagnosed with uh, stress-induced diabetes, and you look at me now, with the exception of the gray hair, I look younger than I did 13 years ago. Wow. And so my, my, you know, my friends, my former coworkers, family, they said, oh, boy, you, you ought to write a book about it. And so I wrote the book and then started coaching others on uh, how to reduce their stress as well. And it's been very gratifying. Oh man, that is an incredible story. Well, thank you for sharing that. You bet. I will, I will say too, anybody who's listening right now and you're like, man, I just want to know more about, you know, Professor Pete, PeteAlexander.com. I know on the about page, you talk more about your story too. Mm-hmm. So, cause there's more to it than just that too. Yeah, so, exactly. So awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And um, so now also, okay. So my third question was, is this show like part of growing a business? Are you trying to sell books or what? Is there a uh, monetary side to this or what? 
So originally when I did, um, I was trying, you know, as when I first started talking to some of my, my network, the, they were referring other people to me and I started thinking, well, you know, maybe I could get some inroads into other companies, maybe that I could provide some stress relief to. But what I found was I had a, a particular question that, um, tried to tee that up. And quite honestly, I never felt like I was being true to myself and I didn't feel like I was being authentic. And so when I, when I removed that and I just was myself and I had no expectation to get something from the guest, that's when the show, the, the conversation, my, my level of excitement with it went way, way up. Okay. Yeah. I totally can relate to that. Okay. That's awesome. Um, that's awesome. Okay. So let's kind of move into the who, so mm -hmm. your ideal audience, their business owners, is that right? Or business. So what, what, what I found <clears throat> their business entrepreneurs and what, uh, the majority of the audience, the, the, uh, demographics of it, they're early in their career. So let's say late twenties, maybe early thirties. And it makes sense because the guests that I have on the show are sharing a business insight that they learned. And so these younger entrepreneurs are benefiting from that information. What can they do to be more successful and learn from other people's mistakes and successes? Okay. I love it. And so um, one thing that I was really curious about as I was listening to it. So what problem are you solving for the listener? Like I, I get mm -hmm. a really strong sense of who you're talking to, but not really like what's the transformation that they can expect by listening. Sure. So what happens is in just a very short amount of time, they can get a business insight that is pretty, it could be very novel or it could be more generic. It really depends on the guest. But if you want to look at somebody who has, is really delivering on you know, their business, they're successful, and you want to get a little bit of behind the scenes of what makes them successful, but you don't have to interview them, that's what you have the opportunity by listening to, to the show. You, get, you find out, okay, what has made them successful? What is something that they are proud of that they can say, yes, this is something that works. And it was interesting because early in on the show, I used to uh, ask only one insight question. And then I realized that there were some people that wanted, had more than one insight that they, they could share. And so I have two questions now. And so uh, a lot of the, the interviews, um, if, if a listener listens to it, they're going to get two different distinct ideas that they can implement fairly quickly in order to improve their business. Okay. Awesome. So, you, and, and then, and I, I'm so bad when I scroll, I don't do date math very well. So are you once a week or do you, is it multiple times a week? Twice a week. Twice a week. Okay. It was three times a week and uh, it just became a lot. <laughs> so yeah. it's twice a week now. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, so do you right now with, as you're putting out content, because you've had over 300 episodes that you've mm -hmm. released, are, how do you evaluate whether your content is resonating with your target audience? And have you made adjustments based on what you've seen? Yes. So. Um, you know, obviously evaluating the number of subscribers, number of downloads, that's something that's just regular analytics that I look at. Uh, what I have done over the, uh, over the year and a half, almost two years that I've been doing this is that uh, I first, I changed some of the questions, um, you know, just finding that, okay, what, depending on how they were answering, when I started hearing similar answers from people, I thought, this is not adding value. So, uh, so I did, uh, I changed around a few of the questions. Um, and I also changed up the branding of the show as well. Um, so I started, uh, you know, I had a green and white uh, design before, and now I have the, the black and purple kind of more, more uh, 
current kind of coloring uh, to, to, to go with it. I also, for the YouTube version, the video version of it, uh, I started doing uh, an intro and an outro uh, animation with it, uh, with music. And then um, more recently, within the last couple of months, I started finding that uh, because LinkedIn is one of the primary places that I promote it, uh, LinkedIn had uh, a limit of 10, has, I should say, a limit of 10 minutes on videos. But about two months ago, roughly, I noticed that if it's, a, let's say, a, a seven or an eight minute video, it took forever for it to upload. It was like LinkedIn was saying, now we'll take a 10, 10 minute video, but we're going to make it very difficult for you. And so what I decided to do was I started uh, taking just one question from my interviews hmm. and using that as a video and then linking to the entire episode on, on LinkedIn. So uh, I'm sorry, on uh, YouTube. So uh, uh, that, that has been uh, a way that people can consume if, if they're looking just for one quick bit of insight, they don't have to listen to the entire episode. They can just listen to a one, one and a half minute video. That's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, so did now when you, I'm just curious, actually, this isn't even usually on it, but so when you changed your uh, your, when you added an intro and outro to your YouTube, did you see any changes in the duration of the watches or the number of downloads? Not significantly. Um, I would have hoped that it would have had a bigger, bigger impact than it did, but it, it really didn't. Um, but here is another one that uh, I learned for your listeners that was actually quite shocking to me. Um, so I, I experimented with transcription of each of my episodes. And that's a lot of work, especially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because even the best transcription software is um, going to only be between 85 and 90% accurate. So you still have to read through all of it. Yeah. And um, so I found, uh, so, but I was, uh, you know, uh, everything that I had read said that, okay, if you have transcription on your videos um, that it will increase, you know, your, your viewers, your subscribers, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. I did not see one iota difference. Wow. And I did this for about six weeks and each one of my episodes, even though it was that the episodes are anywhere from most of them, seven to 10 minutes, that transcription added a good 20, 25 minutes of work at least. Mm. And I found that it wasn't worth it because I did not see any additional YouTube uh, or uh, LinkedIn uh, video views as a, uh, a, a, by doing that. So, mm. you know, YouTube has their own automated one that they, that they use. Um, and quite frankly, you know, it's probably from what I've looked at, it's 65 to 70% accurate. And that's good enough, especially for, um, you know, people that are listening to it in a different language, because YouTube will allow them to transcribe it in a different language. So the, you know, unless you've got an unlimited amount of time or you have a, a great budget to spend to let somebody else do it just because you want to do it, that to me was um, an eye opener that I, because it went against everything I had heard, read, et cetera. Well, and it's funny too, because if you have a show that's, you know, a half an hour or 20 minutes, even you couldn't put all the transcript, all the transcription right. into it anyway. And your 20 minutes turns into, you know, and I, we calculate based on, um, so what we do is we put our audio into otter.ai mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and then I have a human person who goes through it and while they're listening, they, they, uh, they document start and end times of clips that we want to use at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we, and the way that we budget for that is it takes two and a half times the amount of time of the recording. So if it's a right. 30 minute recording, it'll take, what's that? An hour and 15 minutes 
for that person to go through it. And that's after Otto, Otter's gone through it. So, Correct. so you're right, it does. And it, and it goes up the longer that your show is. And most people do have shows that are longer than seven minutes. <laughs> exactly. Well, one thing that I did do, and I use Otter too for um, now with the one, one question video, that one I do a transcription of mm-hmm. because in most cases, it's going to be a minute, minute and a half at the most. And, I, and that I can, you know, I can look and read through it in, in a few minutes. And I, I think your, your, your um, uh, timing is about right. You know, so it's a minute and a half. It's going to take me three, four minutes to read it and edit it. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about what. Let's talk about some of the things that you're doing. And we've touched on some of them, but things that you're doing that are working. Mm-hmm. What what do you think has been the most effective way or maybe a couple ways that you've attracted listeners and viewers so far? Well, I think that um, being able to make the background more professional um, has been something that makes it look like um, I'm more, you know, I'm more legit. So I think that that has been very helpful. So any of your listeners who are doing video, make sure that your lighting is good. Make sure that it looks professional. I mean, like, for example, with you, Tiffany, you've got beautiful lighting. You know, it's, it's you know, you're well-framed. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people on my show where I have to sit for the first 15 minutes and try and get them, you know, positioned right. Because I want them, <laughs> you know, the whole, the, whole, the whole thing for me as a host is to let the guest be the star. Mm-hmm. And so part of my job is to make sure that they, 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 they look and sound good. Um, so making, sh- you know, upgrading my equipment, making it uh, look professional from, from a visual standpoint, from an audio standpoint has been uh, uh, something that has certainly made a difference. Um, and the other one that I started noticing a difference on too, which has been kind of interesting is I, I mentioned earlier about uh, transcribing the one question. Well, what's nice about that is by putting, you know, in, in the description of the show, you have a limited amount of characters that you can put. If I put the transcription of that one uh, question in the body, the description of the, of the show, that helps Google, especially when you put it on YouTube as well, that helps Google uh, uh, index it so that if somebody's looking for a particular uh, you know, keyword phrase, and your the answer the, the the guest's answer has that in there. It's more likely to be found and and greater exposure for the uh, for the show. So that's been uh, been a good one as well. Awesome. So, have do you have anything that you know um, that you've done that you've seen an uptick? Because earlier you mentioned that the way that you determine whether or not you're getting more listeners or viewers is the number of downloads, you know, or Mm -hmm. the number of subscribers. Has there been anything that you've done that you recognize like, oh, I did that. And then the numbers went up. Is there anything that's happened like that? Yeah. um, Anytime that you can get your show on another distribution channel, then you're going to see obviously numbers go up. Um, It's temporary (laughs) in most cases, but it is exciting to see because anytime that you're on a new network, um, you're going to see a big uptick in, you know, just a big um, blip on, on listeners because the network is downloading it to, to have it archived on their site. So that's something if you're looking for it, um, Another one that I find is uh, beneficial that can give an uptick is if you can be a guest on another show that is targeting a similar audience, then you're going to find an uptick as well. And I saw that as well. Okay. Okay. And then if you were to pull like 20 people from your show right now, what do you think has driven most of them to your show? Referrals. Yeah. So, so people, there are, you know, uh, oh gosh, what is it? Two, are there 2 million podcast shows out there now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I yeah. think it's something with some re- re- amazing number like that. And in my experience being a guest, I would say of the well over a hundred shows that I've done, there is easily, easily 25% of them who I would say they should not be doing a show because they're not, you know, they're, they're just not organized. They're not prepared They're, you know, and it's, it's like, 
you, you're on this show and it's kind of like, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. And so why I get so many referrals to my show is because my guests know that they're going to have a, you know, a professional fun experience. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing. In fact, I I wrote this down before I even got on the zoom call with you is one thing that I think you're doing really well is literally on your show. You ask people to refer a guest to your show and it's in a really good way too. So, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit, but so, um, let me rephrase that last question. I asked if you were to pull 20 people who listen to your show, Mm. where do you think, yeah, where do you think most of them got there? Oh, okay. I apologize. I thought no, it was no. it was guests. Um, so it's always blame the host. To... <laughs> you always should blame the host. I always blame myself. I'm like, I'm the host. It's my job. I tell you to trust me. I got to take you to the right station. Exactly. So, so go ahead. But that's that was me. Go ahead. <laughs> so the most of them, if the tw- if, uh, out of twenty, I would probably say fourteen of them, so two thirds roughly, have come from LinkedIn. Okay. As listeners, they do. So, so you think it's the um, posting of the one minute, like they're seeing Correct. the one minute thing and then they're going, okay, Correct. love it. Okay. So that is awesome. That is gold. So I have to, you know, as you can tell, I take notes through this whole thing. So sometimes I'm like, uh, okay, okay. And usually it's like, I'm writing it and it's like, is this in the right spot? So <laughs> um, this one I put in red and bolded because Honestly, I feel like we have, and I do this too, and that's, um, I'm just obsessed with this whole concept, but a lot of times we make assumptions. And so we say, well, I think that this is what it would be. And I think that this is how people get here. But ultimately, if you're, if you know how many people are clicking on those links and getting to your show. And so there is data that actually you could, that would support what you just said. Mm -hmm. A lot of those other things, I feel like sometimes we get, and and I do the same thing, but where we're like, you know, I did this and then it helped. And it's like, well, did we see numbers? Well, no, but I'm pretty sure it was a good idea, you know? (laughs) And so when we get to something where I'm like, I know, like, I believe what you just said, like, I bet that if you went and you looked at your clicks, that that would support what you just said. So I think that that's gold. So anyway, I don't think everything comes from data every time. Um, usually yes. Um, but because I, first of all, podcast data, isn't super. Like it's just not, unless you have a whole person to work on attribution and all these different tricks that we can do behind the scenes to make it happen. But dude, we're trying to do a show, be better at our craft. We're trying to, you know, promote it. So by the time we're doing attributions, we have enough numbers to warrant doing attribution, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so usually when we're right here, it's like, how do I get that momentum <laughs> builds up. And so, um, so part of it is not always looking at the downloads, but if we see an uptick in downloads, it's like, what just happened? Like, um, and then going and finding that supporting information, you know, if you start doing a video, uh, and if you start doing the one minute videos that you're or not one, I always say one minute, they're one question videos and you're transcribing on them and putting them on LinkedIn. And then all of a sudden you notice an uptick, that's enough. You know, Mm -hmm. you know that that's where it's coming from. Uh, And even when we're working with the little numbers, a lot of times it's like, well, you need six figures to really be able to know if the data is supported, but it's like, whatever, like, this is what I have. I need to look at something. Right, (laughs) exactly. Or even if my daughter's like, oh, I saw that you posted that. That's the first time I clicked that link. Okay, I'm doing more of that. You know, I mean, sometimes, but it's, it's like a, it's more of a case study and, a, um, oh gosh, what do you call it when you have like a room full of four people or like 10 people and they're trying out your product and a focus, focus yeah, group? Yeah, focus group. Yes. Yeah. So when you have a small show, just you're, we're looking more at a focus group than we are at solid data. So I'm, you know, probably slipping when I say data, but it's, we need some kind of, verifiable information (laughs) that, that does it. So I love, I love that. That was super helpful. And then, um, now, uh, my next question has to do with brand identity and Mm -hmm. I love, I didn't see the logo before or the, or the branding. I love what it is now. It stands out. Even if I like, uh, when, okay, here's behind the scenes for Tiffany Youngren is when I do these, a lot of times you'll see the lighting change because it has to do with, if I'm looking at a document or if I'm, you know, like on, like, I just went to full camera, so I don't even see my document because 
can you say, can you say hello? Hello. Okay. Awesome. So I, I just want to verify what I was about to say, because <laughs> I wanted your picture up big on mine. But one thing I did notice, uh, I can notice the branding without seeing the words. And so I feel like that's really good. And it's not even about the shape, like the shape kind of, I can't see when it's little, but I, I can tell what it is. So I think it's really fantastic. Um, thank you. But with that said, did you notice, or did you get feedback regarding that branding change? Because I've, and the reason I asked this is a lot of podcasters that I've had in the hot seat, they're like, my branding makes no difference, but I don't like, I don't subscribe to that, (laughs) but I want to see, like, have, have you seen a difference, whether it's feedback or whether it's downloads in that branding change? So the downloads, I don't, I can't attribute directly to it. Um, but I absolutely on the feedback, it really was because, and I, and I, I didn't do anything like, Hey, check out the new branding. What I did was I just started publishing with the new branding and my audience here were just saying, I am digging the new look. And it, it just because it, 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 the, the coloring, it stood out. Um, and, uh, you know, it just made, made for a much, much better presence. And so, you know, it just goes back to the professionalism of it. And so it, 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 it they basically, the feedback they were saying is the coloring is fantastic. And it looks like you have, uh, you've, you're taking this seriously. Mm. Right. Okay. That's awesome. I agree. I think it's really, really good. And then, so you're, you do, my next question is, do you have a social media strategy? So I've heard that you do the one question postings on LinkedIn. Um, do you like, do you have a strategy and you follow it consistently? Maybe not every time a podcast releases, but generally when a podcast releases, you follow the specific strategy. Yes. Yes. So uh, the only thing that's changed is uh, I started publishing also to um, uh, to Instagram more recently, but with Twitter, with uh, Facebook, with YouTube, with LinkedIn, uh, very consistently um, because uh, I wanted to make sure that it got the most distribution it could. And so LinkedIn was my primary. That's where I focus uh, probably... 80% of my effort on. And uh, so that one gets the one question, that one gets the link to the YouTube video. I also distribute uh, the uh, episode or the, the one question posting in a whole bunch of groups. Um, so it gets exposure, you know, basically in mostly in sales and marketing groups that would get an appreciation for this because you have to target that as well. And, um, and then with LinkedIn, I'm sorry, with uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and um, uh, Instagram, the, it's basically, I'm just pointing to the YouTube channel with, uh, with the regular posting. Um, and I'll answer, you know, I'll respond right away to any posts or any comments and stuff like that to those, those postings. But most of the activity is coming off of LinkedIn. Okay. So Facebook and Insta, you point at YouTube for LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Do you send people directly to the episode, um, on YouTube, on on YouTube, YouTube but I upload, I upload an original video of the one question. Okay. So you optimize for video. So you're like, I'm on YouTube, but I also push it out to podcasts. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So I've got, I've got it on all the major uh, podcast channels. Okay. That okay. is nice though. That's automated from my, I, I use uh, megaphone for my, uh, for my distribution. Okay. All righty. And then also now you mentioned posting in groups. Do you mm-hmm. ever go into groups and like build your brand, just like having conversations about things with people, or is it just pretty much like, Hey, here's my latest episode. So I will have separate conversations. Um, I, you know, when it, when an episode publishes, I will publish it to certain groups, but I'm also very active in groups that, you know, if they're having a conversation or something that is uh, of interest to me, or, uh, you know, I will go ahead and I'll have a conversation there. Um, and uh, many times I have uh, actually referred either a guest specifically or my, the episode specifically, because somebody asked a question that was answered on my show. Awesome. That, that was the magic answer. What you just said, 
that was the ideal answer. So I love it. I love that you're doing that. So, um, let me just make a real quick note of that too. Cause I think, uh, it just, it's so overlooked. Rarely do I get that answer. So I'm really excited mm-hmm. that you said that. So, and let's see now. Um, also you have a blog, do your episodes get published on that blog? Mm. Not that I actually know. So one did, one did, um, because <clears throat> I talked about trust. And uh, so usually I keep the, the, um, the podcast, excuse me, separate from the blog. And, but there was one that I talked about trust and I did refer to the, to the episode there. So my blogs for the most part though, isn't promoting uh, the podcast, but what I, one thing that I would recommend to your, um, to your listeners that has worked for me, um, to slow, you know, organically is my uh, podcast link is part of my signature on my email. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so it's part of, and so you're, when you say podcast link, is it like what you gave me where it's like the the podcast page on your website. Right. Okay. And then, um, if I remember correct, I'm just going to look at it real quick. I'm pretty sure. Don't you have, yeah, you have embedded the podcast. Do you, but I don't see the videos in there. Is that so true? If you scroll, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see all the channels I publish too. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so but I mean, as gives, far as embedding the content. Yeah, I didn't. And the reason being is because, uh, the player is able to, you know, if the, the podcast player embeds and then it automatically updates. Mm-hmm. If I, publish the video, I have to go in there every time to publish the most recent episode. And so that's extra work I didn't want to do. Right. Okay. Perfect. And so, okay. And social media, just to confirm everything links to this. Like if you're talking about one episode, it links to that YouTube video specifically. Okay. Awesome. And so where is it that you see yourself taking your podcast? Like where, what do you want to get out of it? Well, it's interesting. I, you know, what, what I get out of it right now is personal branding. That is um, what the bi- biggest benefit is right now. I imagine uh, as I think about what I want to do with this podcast in the future, I'm reconsidering formatting it differently. I'm reconsidering um uh, you know, how many episodes I want to do per, per, per week. Um, but what I would love to do is I'd love to have one where the audience, I'm not after a gigantic audience that I'm just, you know, the same thing for everybody. I want to find a niche that really is a loyal niche of listeners where they Mm -hmm. just say immediately that, okay, if you want to talk about this particular topic, it's Professor Pete's podcast. That's the Mm. one. So if I can get to a brand where that is in the minds of my audience, where they say, yeah, this is a, a, a can't miss this. This is the podcast for this particular niche. I think that would be where I would, I I would find is my apex of, of where, where I'd love to take the show. So your podcast, how would you finish that sentence? my podcast, how I would finish that sentence. Yeah. So I'm, like, I'm, cause you said that, you know, I want them to be able to say this podcast is the perfect podcast to listen to in this niche. So what oh, would so it cur- in this currently, niche, what would that be? So currently I would say for entrepreneurs, this podcast, this podcast is the best one to get, you know, nuggets of insight in a short amount of time. Of probably business insights. Business insights, like, correct. Like, Actually, yeah. it's it's not necessarily that. It's it's winning a business in life. And so uh, several of my guests have talked about what they do personally to take care of themselves, you know, self-care or maybe uh, prioritizing family or something important to them versus their business that has been in, you know, things that they've done. So um, it would be primarily business, but not every time. So it'd be nuggets of insight to help entrepreneurs in it. Correct. However, Correct. that might look. Okay. Um, and then let's see, I actually wrote down a couple more questions. So sure. uh, 
would you say that your podcast is on brand with your website and what is it that you're trying to get from your website? Like what's this whole thing look like for you? Yeah. So um, the podcast is actually a little more colorful than my website. My website's um, this kind of uh, warm brown because uh, I did research before um, I did the, uh, the, the website and kind of the brownish gold is a comfortable, soothing kind of um, color that uh, uh, it works really well for stress relief. Um, when I worked with the designer on the rebrand of the podcast, it was, um, they, they said, oh, it needs to pop a little bit more. So, <laughs> so they, you know, it's, it, it, it's a little bit more um, stand out, uh, but it, it blends well with the website because um, I have it on its own particular page. So people that go to the podcast page versus any other page don't go and go, oh my God, this is totally different, but it is a lot more colorful. Um, versus and when we're the, talking about, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sure. Like versus the, and when we're talking about message, like mm -hmm. you have your website and yes. I guess I'm trying to connect, like you, um, what do you try? Like, I I've seen the, where have you been seen? Mm -hmm. You have this blog post, everything's really amazing. The content's really great, but what are you trying to accomplish with your website? And then would you say that your podcast is part of accomplishing that? Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I put the website, that page on every episode that's distributed throughout the, the podcast, um, the megaphone podcast distribution. And my hope there, the website is there to let people know that, you know, it's not just podcasting that I do. And so if they land on that page, you know, they have the main navigation right there if they're curious about clicking and finding something else. So the website is, is kind of like, for me, is the catch-all for everything. And, you know, whether they come to uh, my website to learn about a particular blog post on reducing stress, and then they go, oh, he's got a podcast too. Okay. Or vice versa. They come and they, they listen to a podcast episode and they go, oh, wait a minute, what is this about a book? Or what is this about, you know, um, learning more about stress relief? So those are the kind of things that the website does for me. It's kind of, you know, I hate to say catch all because it doesn't sound like it's that's that sophisticated marketing, but it really is. It, you know, when I see the analytics and see where people are coming from, the optimization that I've done there ha is definitely uh, giving me benefit. So it's helping drive traffic to Absolutely. get more awareness for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And um, so when you're looking at your podcast now and you see your vision of being known, well, first of all, I guess I'm jumping, this is an assumption your vision right now of wanting of your podcast becoming the, the go-to the place to get nuggets of insight and help for entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, beforehand we did talk about you taking a break and you're regrouping and you're doing some other things and, and taking a hot second. Cause you know, you have done over 300 episodes. Do you, when you come back and return, do you anticipate that that is still going to be your vision or what do you think the new and revised vision would look like? I haven't given it enough thought to, um, to, to clarify succinctly that. Um, but what I have found is that the feedback has been that the, um, the short time frame is really good, um, that they appreciate that information. And what I, part of what I would like to do is I've the the if I was going to say one drawback to the format that I have is that I've had probably let's say fifteen percent of my guests who have been so commercial mm -hmm. that it really it I, I thought about it and I thought you know if I was um, the network news I wouldn't be publishing this um, it just they 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 were promoting themselves too much. And um, so the way that I would be looking at it is making sure that, that the chance of that happening was minimized. Fortunately, 85% of the uh, guests I've had have been 
really good about it with their insight and and share, sharing it, you know, because I do, I, I think most of uh, your podcast hosts will will know that you know guests want to be able to let people know how to get in touch with them, and so I, I you know I have that question at the end uh, to let them promote themselves where they can best be found, but I've had some guests on the show where the they were clearly clearly pushing either a book or um, you know something to do with a promotion that they were 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 having and honestly it, it you know in those the, the, that those guests it was it was like eh, it was more used car salesman and so I want to minimize that. And, and I, I want to make, instead of saying, okay, listen to a, you know, 85% of these interviews, I'd like you to inter- listen to a hundred percent of these interviews because you're not going to get uh, a commercial uh, on any of them. Okay. So that, that was such awesome insight. Also, just to kind of circle back around, would you say that by improving that opportunity with your guest? is still ultimately what you're trying to do is to help entrepreneurs improve their lives. Yes. The listeners, I want to get the listeners to improve their lives. If they're looking at uh, different ways that they could be successful, uh, whether it's in their, in their business or maybe just in life in general, um, that is what, if, if, if the content that is being shared on the show can provide them value, then I've made a difference. And that, that, that would be ultimately what I would like to, to, to be able to provide. And, you know, like I said, in probably 85% of the episodes, there is something really good in it. And whether it's the insight that they shared or the first job that maybe they had, um, something that you learn from that experience, um, it, it, when, when you can look back and you can say, this is what I learned from it. Mm. And this is what I took from that. And this is what, what has helped me. Okay. So, you know, a listener is going to take that and say, okay, did I learn something from it? If so, let me, let me apply it. If it, if it doesn't resonate, then that's okay. You didn't spend a lot of time and hopefully the next episode will be, uh, uh, you'll connect with the, uh, with the guest more. That is, that's awesome. So I have to ask, is this podcast part of your day job or do you have a different job that's unrelated to the podcast? Uh, totally unrelated to the podcast. Uh, okay. So <laughs> my day job is I run a land uh, interior landscaping business. And so uh, that is my, I'm the president of uh, Office Plants by Everything Grows. And uh, so that is my day job. And I also help coach people in stress relief as a, a side gig. And, uh, and then the podcast is a side gig as well. So do you view the helping people with stress and the podcast as completely separate side gigs? Or do you think that the podcast could support, like not support, like monetize so that it can pay for stuff, but support it in a way of helping the coaching grow? It could. Um, so if I was, like I mentioned before about the, uh, I used to have a question that was specific to stress relief. Um, and if I, if I could uh, set it up so that I didn't feel like I was fishing for clients, potential clients, then I think that it would be really good because um, the podcast could help promote opportunities for me on the stress relief side, uh, certainly. And um, the stress relief, um, it actually has uh, gotten a few people, a few new subscribers. And that was primarily because the conversation just came up. And, the, mm-hmm. and, and you know, and most of the people that I coach with uh, on the stress relief are entrepreneurs. Okay. That's awesome. So one more question, and then Mm -hmm. um, I'll see if you have any questions and then we're going to move into that next phase that I told you about. But um, so when, when you're looking at your life and you're, and you've got your business that you own and that you run, and then you've got your coaching that you help people with stress relief, would you call your business with where you coach people and help them relieve stress like your passion project, or is it just a side gig? Does that make sense? Can do you, it does? <laughs> I, it does. I have a lot of passion for it. Um, 
it is the kind of thing, you know, I wish I could say that I, I, I made tons of money from it. I don't. And the reason I don't is because it's the kind of thing that needs to be out there. Yeah. I, 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 it's more for me to be able to help people not end up what happened to me. And too many of us are um, putting our health aside because we don't know any better, or mm -hmm. we always think that we'll get, you know, we'll always have time for our health. But the fact of the matter is without our health, nothing else matters. And so I kind of, I always, uh, what I like to do is I always look at, um, you know, when it comes time for me to be done on this earth and I look and I, and I've always said, I want, I want to make a positive difference. And if making the, if my positive difference was to communicate to others, to be careful, don't take your health for granted and make sure that you do something to help reduce your stress that then I've made a huge impact, you know, even if it's on, you know, one or a few people. So it's a passion project. It's, you know, side gig is, I, I call it side gig because people um, always ask, what's your primary thing? So my primary thing is, of course, the, the, the business that I have. But the business allows me to have the opportunity to help others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by doing this stress relief work, there is, you know, even if I, if, if when, when I do these one hour webinars, and I have a group of people in there. The fact that some people just say, oh my gosh, I, you know, something you said just resonated so much with me that made all the difference in the world. I can't tell you about how many people who I talked to afterwards who said, you know, I, I started doing something different and I can't thank you enough. Mm. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, there's, there's no monetary, monetary value on that. But that is what drives me. It's it's what used to drive me when I was a college professor because you know you don't make a big money as a college professor, but when you can have an impact on students, then that's that's the the gratification that I look for, and that's what I've been doing with the uh, stress relief work. I love it. I love it. That's so great. And um, you know, honestly, I we, my husband and I, we work together and we're always talking about redefining retirement. You know, we mm -hmm. want to be doing the things that we love, you know, and I, and I probably shouldn't have even called it a passion project because of course you're passionate about it, but, but these things where we love doing it, you know, it's just enjoyable when, when I, I could seriously be looking at a task that I have to on it. Okay. This is real. Like I get real on these shows. So literally there's never been an interview where I haven't gone, Oh, I have an interview to do like never. I'm always like, but I also am like that. Like, Oh, I have to get ready to go to Belize. Like I, I am just like mm -hmm. that. Like I just have that mm -hmm. moment where I'm like, Oh, do I really have to go do this? I just want to like curl up in my little ball and not go anywhere and not talk to anybody. And that's, that's the opposite of what's about to happen. And, but then every time when I do it like this one, I'm like, Oh my gosh, we're going to do this an hour and 15. It's gonna be no problem. And it's like, yeah, but then I, I get so excited about it and I actually care <laughs> and I get into this space. And, and so I feel like if I had a magic wand and everybody could, that's how they feel when they do their work, it feels like retirement. Like I imagine Absolutely. that that's what a retirement is going to feel like. I mean, you know, yeah, I would rather be in warmer weather, but my family doesn't live there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the thing is, is like, and so that's really what I'm trying to get down to is like, um, podcasting is awesome, but as a host, it can, it can really drag if you're not into the topic, you know, and, and like, right. you look at my show and it's like, you know, it's next up nation, but you know, there was the masterclass series and then there was the true stories from real podcasters. And then now we're doing the hot seat. You know, the next one I think is going to be called, well, I'm not even going to tell it. I'm not going to release that yet, but, <laughs> but I have like this whole nother idea because it just gets boring. It's like, I've already told everybody to start a blog. I've already told everybody, like, you're going to hear stuff that everybody listening to the shows and be like, Oh, yep. I already know what she's going to say, you know? And the thing is, it's like, but everybody needs that, but there's a way we can repackage it. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So it's not mm -hmm. like, it's the same topic. We talk about the same exact things. I'm still going to say like, everybody needs a blog, you know, but the, but the bottom line is, is we, if we're loving what we're doing, it's okay that it supports what feeds us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, 
because we all have to make money. And at the end of the day, you want loyal listeners. So I'm hearing you say, it's not about getting a million people to listen. It's about, I want it to matter the people who are listening. I want it to matter to them. And I, and they are in turn going to matter to me. And I'm going to have an, a vested interest in what they're getting out of my show. So if you imagine that kind of listener, they're going to want to know what that next step is. You know what I'm saying? If you right. have a podcast, so this is my disconnect and why I keep bringing it up not to like, I, I hope this totally makes sense to you, but if you have a show and it's completely disconnected to everything else you're doing, there's always going to be this little bit of a, like, why won't this one cog won't catch, you know, it's like we were running and then I remember once I'm like, ah, this isn't quite catching. And it's weird when there's a monetization piece. So like, you know, yeah, sometimes when people come on my show, they become clients, but I don't really want to say it because that sounds weird. I found, I sound like a sales guy and I was in a hospital because I ended up in a job like that. I don't want to have flashbacks, you know? Mm -hmm. And so but we have to put our different hat on about like, this is really about connecting with people. Uh, they know, like, and trust you. They want to know, like, what do you recommend for me now? You know, that kind of thing. So, um, so that's why I feel like, um, my first sense is to think like, I really would love to see your show more connected to your project of helping people out of stress. And mm. it seems like that could be done in just a couple of tweaks. So that gets us into the next phase. So before we do, is there anything else that you want to share with me before I start more of what you just saw where I'm like talking about uh, what I love, what you're doing in you know, areas of opportunity? Is there anything else that you want to share that maybe you feel like you haven't gotten to articulate about your show? Sure. Um, it's interesting that you said about, oh, that it gets boring talking about this or that. And, you know, I've, I've been asked that about my show where, you know, you ask the same six questions. Isn't that boring? And, you know, here's, here's the thing that why it never got boring for me, because A, I knew that each person was going to answer it differently. Mm -hmm. But B, I always thought that this is going to be the opportunity for me to make a new friend. And I would say that of all the 310, because there'll be one tomorrow, uh, 310 episodes that I've done, the, I would say that probably, you know, 50% of them were, you know, just good, good conversation, nice person, certainly would talk to them again in the future. 15% of that, so we're at 65%, were forgettable and uh, never would, would talk with them again. And the other 35% were people that I actually call friends mm. and only because I had them on the show. And so that kept it going for me where I wouldn't get bored because you know what? This is somebody new that's talking about something and I'm either going to learn something or I'm going and or I'm going to establish a friendship going to have a laugh together, whatever it happens to be. So, um, so that, that, that helped me to get my mind around the fact that, yeah, I'm asking the same questions, but each show is different. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. Well, and I'm such a fan of relationships are first when it comes mm -hmm. to podcasting. And one thing I've noticed with you is you're very focused on the guest so much so that like that, it seems like that's your first thought is like, mm -hmm. what about the guest, the guest, which is a, a guy after my own heart. Like I, I feel the same way. Um, you know, I've, I've learned to balance that. Like there are people listening that might be able to ha be helped, but, but those relationships that we build with guests are so valuable. So I completely, I love what you just said. So, so with that, can, do I have your permission to move into the next phase and we'll talk Absolutely. about, okay, awesome. Awesome. So before I do, I always like to start with, uh, the four P's uh, of podcasting. So before the show, which we talked about um, the two things I promised one, I would be prepared. And the other is that I would give you one actionable step that would get you results in 30 days. Okay. So with those recommendations, I just feel like the four P's are so important because they, they interconnect. And uh, if one is not addressed, then it affects all the rest somehow. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's okay. And sometimes it's not. 
Uh, number one is to know your purpose, which is why we talked about your why at the beginning, because it, it keeps us excited. Like what we just saw you talking about talking to guests and things like that. Number two is to know your people who are your guests and who are your audience. I, I started recently, I started saying like, those are your two new best friends, right? So mm -hmm. I always think of them as two people. They're faceless until I actually have a guest and then they get to have these smiling, happy faces. But, but, but the guest, you know, we've got a promise to them and then our audience, and we need to have a promise with them. So it's like, there's three of you and everybody's super, super important. Uh, number three is the promotion. So getting it out there, you don't want to be the best kept secret, right? You've got this great show that nobody knows about. We're not helping anybody. Right. Uh, and then also the proceeds, like whether it comes from being underwritten by a business or whether you're making money on your show, the fact of the matter is, is there's always some cost involved. And as time, you know, I know for myself, as I, even if I'm making, you know, we invest in real estate. So if I'm the one producing the show, but then I'm not getting a multimillion dollar deal, <laughs> somehow the math doesn't work. And so exactly. yep. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> we have to understand that money plays a, plays a part in this and that with more of it, it buys more time. It also buys more promotion because we're able to do more with that side of it. So, so four P sound good. Any questions about that before we go on? No. Okay. Awesome. I always want to have that. Honestly, I don't even think I say that for anybody, but myself, cause I'm like, okay, now remember, keep the main thing, the main thing, <laughs> because I get all, I get all excited about, about what I do. I know it's amazing that I even brought up that I ever, don't look forward to this part. I just love, I just love this. So every yeah. podcast is different and you are going to hear about the blog. <laughs> you, and, and, you know, sharing that, 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 that brings, uh, you know, that little bit of vulnerability is, it just makes you connect with your audience more. <laughs> awesome. Really. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and for all my guests, I love you. Like I would say probably there's like a 95% that I could pick up the phone and call any one of them. Like I love, I love my guests so much. Oh, so that's sweet. And I appreciate the time. Like I just value it so much. So, okay. So first we're, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about what I feel you're really strong at with your show. Just some of them, because there's a lot, there's things I'm going to miss, I'm sure. Uh, and then some areas of opportunity, not all of them. In fact, most of them just look at as just feedback someday, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then I'm going to share one thing that I think will have the most impact with the least amount of effort based on what you're already doing, what you're already strong at. Sound okay. good? Sounds good. Okay. So some things, some of these things will be repetitive because I've mentioned it earlier. Uh, number one, I love that you ask for referrals on your actual show. So, and, and the way that you do it is beautiful because you're like, Hey, who do you think? And I, and you'll like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get the words exactly right, but this is my perspective of what I heard. But in memory is you say something like, you know, who do you think could you, you know, deserves a shout out and, could, would be a good, you know, would be a good fit to be on our show or, or however you ask. I just love it. It just sounds so, it is thoughtful. It's like this opportunity for that person to come on and do that. And I'm just going to be honest again, like one of them I was listening to, they're short. So I got to listen to more than I do most of the time for the show. But um, one of them, clear pitch factory. Like it was just constant, like my book, my book, my book, my book, my book. Mm -hmm. But then it was like, okay, so who would you like to give a shout out to? And it was, that was, I liked, I liked that person the most at that moment. Cause it was like, all of a sudden they were like giving, right. It was like mm -hmm. all of a sudden someone else. And so I was like, wow, not only did that other person get a shout out, you have a referral for your show, but you also just made your guests look good. And I feel mm -hmm. like as hosts, I mean, for me, that's my number one thing. Like, like right. I say, like when I'm coaching somebody on how to be a, a good host, like we have a group called Hostmasters, And, um, I always say like, it's our job to make the guests to make the show run. So if you're complaining about the guests, usually it's something we need to tweak. Um, and anyway, so I just love that. I thought, wow, that's brilliant. You just made that guy look good. And he did not look Thank good. You. Until then. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't even remember what he was saying. I think I, I don't know. I, and I a lot of times I do it when I'm getting ready. And so I space out and think about something else when they're just pitching too much. So I love that. Um, and then also, I love that you do things subtly. The fact that I had so many questions about what your motives were behind a lot of the questions, I think really mm -hmm. speaks to the fact that you weren't hitting people over the head. Like I am trying to reduce your stress right now, you know, because I almost feel like if someone was like, oh, this is stress reduction. 
okay, do you, you know, like, show me what you got. Whereas the way that you did it was like, it literally was like, wow, why are you asking that? Like it's such an odd question. So you have very thoughtful questions. So it's not like you have seven questions you have, and it probably a lot of it, I'm, I'm imposing my assumptions on you, but I'm assuming it has to do with the fact you have a strong marketing background, you have sales experience, um, but also you truly, you know, you've been in that spot. So Mm-hmm. Um, and, but the biggest thing it shows is that you've done a good job of adjusting your questions based on answers that you've gotten so that you're getting a more open-ended question. So you're getting different answers each time. Cause I noticed right. that too, like, as I'm listening to your show, I'm like, wow, those are different answers. So those are very well-constructed questions. <laughs> so, um, and then groups, I already went I already, you know, went gooey about how awesome that was that you're doing a great job with groups and consistency. Uh, that's the other thing, like you've stuck with it. Um, you know, there's a couple of things that we're going to talk about areas of opportunity that it's so unusual that in fact, I'll just say one of the areas of opportunity that I, that I think is just having a more clear, what you want out of your show. Like, I, I like that, you know, you want to meet people and, um, you know, one time I interviewed when I was 19, I interviewed for American airlines. They flew me out to Dallas to do like a full on interview, to be a flight attendant. And they literally told every single one of us that if you say that you want to be a flight attendant because you like people or you want to travel, you will be sent home immediately. Like those are the two <laughs> things like get out right now. And so I feel like, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but number one is just knowing you know, why you want to do it. Don't just do it because, oh, that's what it was. Don't just do it because you want to get to know people. I mean, do it for that, but have another reason, like have another one that you're reaching a little bit harder because if we don't get a payoff, we quit. That's the mm-hmm. thing that I, that, and that's why I wanted to transition into the opportunities because when I'm hearing your why, and then I look at over 300 episodes, I'm like, wow, I don't know how you did that. Like, that's amazing. You have, that's why consistency made it to that list. I'm like, you just have like, you just get stuff done, (laughs) you know? So, I mean, does that make sense? What I was just saying at all? It does. And it's, and that's part of what, what I'm going to be looking at is uh, yeah. Figuring out what the true purpose is net, you know, so that everything, everything is aligned to that purpose. It's kind of like that North star, I think is Mm -hmm. what the, what I would, would call it. And the payback, like you need to know what your payoff is, you know, you need, in addition to wanting to meet people and, you know, scratching your itch to be in broadcasting, what is it that your show is giving to you? And that's not a selfish question. It's just a fact. Like we do everything that we do, there's a payoff and we just have to know what that is. And why do you need to know people on LinkedIn? If it's not part of your business, you know what I mean? Like that was my big question was like, yeah, but like you could do anything and, you know, so then what, and, you know, where do you take them from there? And, and, and they want that too, from the relationship. They're like, I mean, it's great to know you, but what, what next I trust you. So, so again, I just challenge you to really understand what your show is, what your payoff is from your show as well. Um, and then also, uh, uh, I would, especially since you're taking some time and you're going to be looking at your, why you're going to be looking at, at these things is really lean into your story. If you feel comfortable to do so, like you have it on your website. Mm-hmm. Um, and seven minutes is hard. You can't really, you know, do all, everything in the seven minutes, but even if people just got to see a little more of you at every episode, um, and maybe I didn't listen to the right ones. Like maybe you've done that a lot in other episodes, but from the ones that I was listening to, I just didn't, I didn't get a sense of the depth of where you're coming from. And then when I learn like what you went through to bring this to people, I'm like, oh, okay. Now I'm really ready to hear what you have to say, you know? And Mm. so just kind of share a little, I would just lean a little bit more into your story if you're comfortable doing so. Um, And then also just a small thing is, and so this is like a super easy thing is, um, and and again, maybe this has to do with the ones I listen to, but when I, I listen to Spotify when I mm-hmm. prep for shows, um, I also listen to Apple, but for, for this purpose, I always listen to Spotify. Uh, just make sure you've got those links in the description. So as you're doing the description, I love that you have a system, a systematic way to create your description, but also include the links. Like if you would like to, you know, watch us on, vi- cause sometimes things show up on video uh... that aren't on audio. So even if 
personally, I would always link to your website because then I would say the next step that I would say on this areas of opportunity is that optimizing your website for a next step would be a big thing because if people are showing up to your website because of content from your podcast, um, you know, you, what's the next thing? Like, yes, there are links, but you know how visual people are. So if right. someone wants to watch you on YouTube, maybe just have an episode on there that you just leave on. It's your favorite one. Mm -hmm. It epitomizes everything you're trying to do. Boom. That's the one that you have on there. You don't have to change it ever again, <laughs> or it. you can, although I'm going to talk about blog posts and then, but that adds work. So I don't know, um, how viable it is, but, um, so links in description, lean into your story. Number, another thing would be to, when I know you optimize your social media for LinkedIn, and now you're adding Instagram, which Instagram posts are so different from everybody else. So it's awesome. You know, so clearly there are two different kinds of posts. Um, you know, if there's a way to automate, just pushing those LinkedIn posts out to other things, I mean, can you get more out of social media? If you optimize a Twitter post for Twitter? Yes. However, getting the links out onto Twitter is really valuable also. And it helps with the SEO because you've got those backlinks. The other thing is like when I moved to Billings, I moved to Billings almost 10 years ago and nobody was on Twitter and I did content marketing and I was like, okay, so this is my secret sauce. You have a blog post and then you push little micro pieces of the content out onto the internet. And you say, Hey, if you want more of these tips, and it was always like what you said, like the answers to the questions, like you put the meaty stuff out on social so that you're like, Hey, there's more. And then you bring them back. So, uh, and I was always like, all my clients were like, we live in Billings. Nobody's on Twitter. And, but I would show them the data and I'm like, people are clicking on your links. Like that's what you're paying me is getting people to your website and they're coming to your website. Mm -hmm. So even though we're, it's probably less than if you love Twitter, but you don't love Twitter. So why do it? So mm -hmm. just as one more thing, um, if there was a way, you know, maybe a free subscription to like, um, one of those free social media posting tools or something. So you're doing the LinkedIn and then you just push it out to everything else. It, it'll mm -hmm. take a little bit of time, but, um, and then also the audience promise. So we talked about like knowing what you want out of your show. Um, it, it, just being more clear about, you know, you say it at the beginning of your show, these are seven minutes long because business people are busy we need to keep the time short. However, they still won't put seven minutes into it if they don't feel like it's valuable. And while listening through the whole seven minutes, they're going to get it. They're going to be like, oh, okay, I did get something out of it. However, if you don't give them a clear audience promise at the beginning, and what I mean by that is from the sales perspective, it's the same thing where it's like, this is how this might change. You know, this is going to, how your, your day is going to be changed. Like if you listen to my show for a month, you're going to have at least you know, five or six easy to implement things that you, it's just going to tweak your life and it's going to improve what's happening. Um, but just something where they know this is what you're going to get out of my show by listening to it. Um, and I'm giving you so many big things. So I'm not going to, I wouldn't even say that's a price. I mean, it is like, if you're thinking, since you're thinking about things, I would just add that to your plate as far as like, just know what your audience is going to get out of it because that's your other best friend and they deserve to know how their next seven minutes is going to be spent. Um, and then also just a small thing is just training your guests to focus on the audience. And I think as you're crafting your audience promise, you're going to be setting that example that the audience is that third best friend. And so by talking to your guests, um, and I wouldn't even talk to them, it would be like, you know, my email sequence getting onto my show. Like there's all these, like, these are ways that you can improve your experience. And you know, this is how to make the opportunity better. Th that's just like, if I had a problem with my guest pitching, I would 100% have an email in that email of tips. And I think I actually do say something about that where it's like, I'm going to make you look great. Um, but you need to not talk about your stuff <laughs> till the end. Like, I, so I don't know, I would just craft some really nice, gentle way to be like, you know, we all want you to, we want people to want to look you up afterwards. So part of that is not pitching <laughs> during the show, but you, you know how to word things awesome. Mm -hmm. So something mm -hmm. to that effect. Um, and then, yeah, yeah. So those are the areas of opportunity. So I haven't told you my, if I were boss of the world thing yet, but do you have any questions or comments 
about that fire hose that I just pointed at you? No, they're really good. And, and, uh, I wrote down each one of them. I'm curious. Um, so one of the things that I did, you know, as you were saying, especially with like that last one about no pitching, um, that I'm certainly going to edit there, but what I found was that, um, and what was recommended as I continued to further refine the show was um, one of the most frustrating things I found from some guests is that they really looked great. They were awesome on the show. And then I publish it and they don't even like or share it or comment. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, you have lost the opportunity to engage with a new audience. And it's, why did you bother taking the time to do this? And so what I did was, uh, as part of my sequence, I added uh, the fact that you're uh, that they're going to agree to, you know, comment and share. And then I, you know, I do follow ups with the links to the different channels and how they do that. And that had no effect on getting them to share. So I'm curious um, with asking, like, for example, guess no pitching and stuff. Do you, do you think that they'll actually read that? Because the people that I found that do the pitching are usually the ones that have assistance. And mm-hmm. that, that, that actually is another thing that, um, I found is been, um, a red flag when an assistant reaches out to me to be on the show. Um, I, I, tend to be a lot more, um, uh, I would say a lot more challenging to get on the show because Mm -hmm. I, I, they have to prove to me that it's actually, I'm going to talk, you know, I'm going to be interacting with them and not an assistant for most of this experience. Yeah. Okay. So we're really getting into what it's really like to be a host, right? Where you're the one paying for everything. You're the one taking Mm -hmm. all the time out. You're doing Mm -hmm. all this research on how to make this great show hosts get on. And then they complain because they don't get to pitch their stuff enough. They're not shared enough. Like there's this big tug of war, right? Back and forth. Um, the biggest thing that number one, with the whole promotion, I, it's a pet peeve of mine too, but I have seen a lot of success from number one, number one, they have to feel like the value that they're getting out of it is great. You know what I'm Mm -hmm. saying? Like, for example, with the hot seat series, I would say that the cross promotion from people that have actually shocked me that they promoted it. Cause I've been doing this a long time and usually nobody promotes it, but now I'm interviewing podcasters. So I had this expectation like, Oh, they're going to promote it more in the beginning. No, not so much, unless they're really good friends of mine. And then of course they would do it. Um, and probably your 35%, hopefully they're sharing it really mm-hmm, absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. More, more like 50%. Yeah. Okay. And that's really, actually that's statistically, it's really good, but I'm like you, I'm like, everybody should love this. Like this is amazing. They get to get all this great exposure. A lot of them, especially when they have assistants, they're on so many shows that I think it's kind of back to the same as if a podcaster is just pushing out content and not promoting it. I think it's a similar kind of approach. One thing that we do, and it does take some extra effort is that we have content that we'll give to them. So like we create quote graphics. So Mm -hmm. it's like brilliant things that they say. I actually have like a Dropbox folder that I create and give them a shareable link to it. And it's Mm -hmm. literally the content that I share. So it's like, (laughs) here's the content you can share it. We'll share it. Um, And, you know, and then, and that's helped a lot. Do they always do that? No, but because I've done that, they see that all this, they're just, it's a perception of value. It's similar to when you build a website and you have a lead magnet, if you're going to ask for the email address and the name and the phone number, that lead magnet, that giveaway better be really, really good. Right. Right, Of course. and 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 it's an even bigger ask to say, Hey, guest, could you share this? Like that's a, you know, if you imagine it in the levels of cross promotion, get someone giving you their email address, name and phone number on a website is a lighter ask than a, Hey, influencer, will you please share or not influence, I mean, influencer or not like person who's on, who likes promoting things. So I would just say number, you know, number one is what level of value do they perceive that they've gotten out of the show? Number two, um, 
you know, giving them content helps. One thing that I've noticed too, is the longer that I wait between the time of the episode and the time of the release, the longer it is, the less likely they are to share too. Yeah. I found that so, too. And, and I, so and sometimes I, sometimes it's unavoidable. Yeah. Like I know right. for me, <laughs> I would yeah. love to, I'd love to do everything for everybody <laughs> all the time, but unfortunately <laughs> I have to, we, we have to make choices sometimes. So, but, um, and, okay. And I will say too, so I have, for the most part, avoided being on other people's shows, probably because of my whole weirdness. Like I'm just weird. So I, I just get, <laughs> like, I agree to something. I try to say yes, because I know that things are good for me. And then, I mean, I don't know how many times I've told my husband, thank you for making me go to that. Like we go to a dinner and I'm like, oh, I don't want to go to that dinner. And, he, and then he makes me go. And then I'm like, well, that was the funnest thing I've ever done. I can't believe it. So that's just my personality. I do it mm -hmm. all the time, every time. Um, and so because of that, I haven't been on a lot of people's shows. Um, however, if they ask me, I always say yes, but I typically don't go out and be on other people's shows because I just, I'm like, I've got a system to get myself on people's shows, but I just don't use it. Um, <laughs> however, I was on a show recently and they keep asking me to promote it, which I want to do, but I have number one, not seen it at all on any of their stuff. And so I don't have anything to share. Number two. I have no media. Like, what am I supposed to say? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that comes down to, you have successful people on your show, make it as easy as you possibly can for them to share. If you tell them, I am going to share this, will you please click share, <laughs> you know, or, or even on LinkedIn, all you got to do is comment, you know, yeah. I would, I would just be saying, you don't want to share it. Fine. Could you just comment on mine when I tag you, you know, and especially yeah. Because you can't automate it, automate tagging either no, on LinkedIn. Can, you so you can't. have to like, that's a lot of effort. So I think that's Trust a reasonable me. ask. <laughs> yeah, you would think that. And that's what is really surprising me because I, I, I actually have done this. Um, when I send them the confirmation that everything has been published and please share, comment and share to expand you know, the reach, I give them the links to it. And I actually give them a nice graphic. And it... Uh, <laughs> Do you do, do you do all of that at once? I do it, uh, the day that it publishes. Yes. Okay. So if, 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 if it's really important that you get there in them doing something one time, I would be like, here's a graphic watch for it. I'm also going to do it. Could you please comment like, mm. and then that's it. And then if nothing, and then of course for me, I don't have time. So I always build automations for all this stuff, but then it would be the next sequence would be like, Hey, you know, this was such a great episode. We're so excited about, you know, whatever. And actually I wouldn't even automate that. Cause I'd want to say something for real. Like, this is really what I loved about it. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, could you please just go comment on it? I know you're busy, but you know, could you just, you know, that kind of thing where it's like, they only have one thing to think about. And if someone, if someone emailed me, and I'm trying to even just thinking of the last show I was on, cause it was like a produced show. So it was mm -hmm. amazing. And I just thought, you know, even now I'm thinking, you know, if, if they had sent me something first to say, Hey, we're going to post it. Could you comment? Also, here's a, a graphic. I would have shared the graphic and I would, and I always comment if someone tags me in it, I always comment, Yeah, same here. but then, but then if I got another email the next time that said, Hey, could you just go comment on it? I would do it. Like mm -hmm. if I had forgot, like I, sometimes I forget. So I would see that as a help versus a nag. You know what I mean? Mm. So a lot of times as we're sending emails too, we have to kind of release ourselves from the thinking that we're nagging at people, but really we're trying to do it out of a helpfulness because it's right. going to help them too. Like if they comment on LinkedIn, that shows up on their feed. It shows up on our feed. Like it looks mm -hmm. good for everybody and they don't have to do much. And so right. assuming that they're busy. And so you could structure the email like that. Like, I know you're super busy and um, you know, so I just thought I'd help out and make this as easy as possible, but you know, it's going to show up on your feed. It'll show up on my feed. It boosts both of our algorithms, you know? So, um, so I'm sure with all the busyness, it's probably hard to see. And if you're doing it manually, even just a link to that post even, mm -hmm. and just make it, but, but when you're talking about busy people, um, and they make the best guess, I just would say if it's the more important that it is to you, the more I'd be hands-on making it one option as easy as possible. So they're not having to make any decisions. Cause you think about it, especially people who accomplish a lot, they have to make decisions all, all the time. And so the last mm -hmm. thing they want to do is like, 
So, cause they're probably thinking like, which do you want? Like, do you want, cause that's what I always think. I'm like, well, do you want me to do the graphic or do you, and then I'm like a confused mind says no. So I, I go past the email and you know, so anyway, so that those would be some ideas that I would say would be helpful. Any other yeah. questions or comments? Or no, did that, I, I, I like, I, you <laughs> answered me there. I, I think I, you know, I never, never did that as a follow-up. Um, I kind of just went, well, it's like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then like- that's kind of the result you get to, cause you do have 50%, which is really good. So I would mm-hmm. say if on your whatever phase you're getting 50%, it's really, really good. Um, yeah. but if you want to, if you want to up that number, I just know that that would be one way to make it really also I- that perception of value, um, can command, uh, requirement that the principal has to fill out the application. So when you were on my show, what does it say? It's like your assistant can't fill this out Mm -hmm. because you know what happens on this show is assistant does it. And then they're like, Oh, hot seat. What? And I'm like, exactly. Seriously. Like it's bad enough that guests don't listen to the show, but if you're literally going to not even know what the format is. It's the most frustrating thing that I run into. So it's like, (laughs) clearly there are a lot of good assistants out there. So I'm not trying to cast aspersions, but it just drives me crazy. It's like, they should see that (laughs) there just needs to be some communication, slow down people. But anyway, so that does help. That does help. Um, I, I have seen a much, I mean, I get fewer applications, but, but as podcasters, part of our job is to, I mean, it's really a way of self-filtering, right? right? So it's like, if they're too busy to even know what the format is, I don't want them on my show, you know, exactly. honestly. And, and especially for you where it's like, you know, you're doing this just out of like a desire to do this. You want to talk to these people. You want to meet them. I would just say, I give you permission, like just do them once a week and not have to mess with all that, those, you know, that experience of people not, you know, reading stuff or respecting what you're doing. So I don't know. Yeah, so that's a good yeah. question. I it like is. It. it is. And I think, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. I, I, I started really filtering uh, a lot of the guests and uh, it helped. So I've only, you know, in the last couple of months, I've only had one or two that I was like, uh, but uh um, so it, it is, it's, it's really good for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Awesome. Okay. So I'll, I'll share my, if I was boss of the world and what's the one thing that, that I would have you do, Yeah. I, always, I try to keep it to something where you're kind of already doing it, but you know, here's something that you can tweak, um, that would help. I would say that, um, I'm just kind of looking through the list because one of them that's really, I think really easy would be leaning into your story more because you could mm-hmm. fold that in just like you do with, um, you know, wanting to have stress relievers and you're not really saying it. I would just do it that same way where you're like able to say something about, about your own story. And then, um, but at the end of the day, I think the thing that's a little bit hard, so that's the easy one, but I'm going to give you also a little bit of a harder one. And that is your audience promise. I just think that if you're just really clear in the first, cause you're good at just getting to the point. And if part of that point was a succinct explanation of like, Hey, you're here because you're a busy entrepreneur. Um, and just a before and after. So like, you know, you're probably stressed out. You just need a good idea, but you don't have a half an hour boom, this is what you're going to get, you know? So, um, but you do a good job of explaining what the show is. So that's not, you know, it's just a nuance (laughs) again. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that, um, the nuance is going to just leaning it more towards the audience and what you're promising them versus, um, how you're going to get there. Like, I like that you say, Hey, nobody's got that kind of time. Um, but you also want to use, you know, tell them that, without telling them that you're using it really, really well. Is that helpful? Yeah, it does. It's that's really, really good. And, and such great feedback. I greatly appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Pete, thanks again so much for being on the show before we go though. I just want everybody to know where to find you. I know you've got your website, Pete Um, and then if they want to go right to your podcast, it's slash podcast, right. where else can they find you and who do you think would be just could not, that would just get the most out of your show. 
Sure. So they can find me also on LinkedIn. That's my primary uh, social media, uh, Professor Pete Alexander. Um, and it would it most the 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 audience that would most likely benefit from the from the program are uh, those that are early in their career startup kind of thing with a with a business that they're trying to get off the ground or early stages of it and and want some ideas on how to really build that business more. So probably somebody in there, I would guess, late 20s, early 30s. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I know I've, I've kept you so long. I thought, man, we're going to just nail this super quick. And it was a little bit even on the longer side. But before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we wrap? Sure. Uh, I would just remind everyone who's listening, you know, whether you're a podcaster or, you know, business person or both, et cetera, be very careful about your health. Don't mm -hmm. trade your health for your career or other responsibilities because that's a very bad trade. Mm, that is very good advice. Very good advice. Well, Hey, to everybody who's listening, don't be average, be brave, take action and make magic happen. Thank you so much for listening.